Today again we will talk about anthocyanin pigment. Why? Because it is so important and it is so widely naturally occurring that it needs another uh, lecture to discuss. And one very common plant that we see around us which is a very big source of anthocyanin dye and that is rose flowers. You must have seen that you know there are so many varieties of uh, roses, but the native red colored rose has so much of anthocyanin pigment that it can be a source of huge source of na this natural dye. Another thing because it is you know used for uh, offering to the god and goddesses this flower is abundantly also available from the temple vase. So, it can be a real good source of natural dye and therefore, we will dedicate one more lecture to this anthocyanin pigment and its use and today's focus will be on the rose pigment that is uh, derived from the rose flower. As you all know that it is a natural pigment and more than 550 different types of anthocyanins are present in fruits and flowers of plants that grow in India. It is the most important pigment of plant after chlorophyll. So, you see I mean chlorophyll is the green pigment which we all know and the entire photosynthesis and all that happens because of the chlorophyll pigment. And next to that is the anthocyanin. So, it is that widely and abundantly available. When anthocyanin, when we talk about anthocyanin dye, we are talking about anthocyanidine plus sugar. And as uh, what I would uh, go back again to the, the slide and show you what it means. They, these anthocyanin dyes have other roles also to play. They attract insects on pollination, it poses antioxidant and anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial and anti-cancer activities and protection from UV vis radiation and it has also been used as a pH indicator for the first time in our laboratory. So, you see that it has a lot of features that need attention to describe. Now, so, today we are going to look at the newer dyeing approach with rose anthocyanin and therefore, we must dedicate uh, some time to the way the rose uh, anthocyanin is extracted. We must see how it is uh, used for dyeing and what are the shades and the color depths that can be derived on different fabrics that is cotton, silk and wool. So, that we know that there is a huge applicability and we can prove that. As we all know that dyes and pigments are substances that impart color to a material. This is now time and again we have been talking about this. Dyes are usually soluble in water while pigments are generally not soluble in water. Most dyes are organic compound whereas pigments may be inorganic compounds as well. Pigments generally give brighter color and may be dyes even are also they are brighter than the dyes, but still dyes have more applicability pigments are only used for printing and other purposes because of their insolubility uh, or uh, because of their insoluble nature. Now, there are several advantages as I have been talking about the advantages of natural dyes. But let us recap and you know let us have a re-look at it. They are obtained from renewable sources and our emphasis has been that we should use plant parts which grow again and again. Instead of taking the roots and destroying the plant once for all, it is better to take either the flower or the leaves or the stem which can be uh, regenerated. They have health and safety aspects, they are biodegradable. And now they have been proven to be cost effective and they are eco friendly because of the biodegradability as well as compatibility with the nature. Now, one thing that there was a myth 
that it is not cost effective because that time there were no organized farming. The availability was a big factor and there were very few companies who were making natural dyes. So, therefore, they were selling at a very exorbitant price, but that scenario has completely changed in the last few years and now we have natural dyes available from several companies who sell it um, almost at a very nominal price. And when we were trying to look at the dissemination of the natural dye technology lecture, I had also shown you that there is only a marginal change in the dyeing cost, a cost varying from 4 to 9 rupees in the case of a shirt and maybe 50 rupees in the case of a sari. So, that is the kind of you know little co uh, cost enhancement, but look at the other aspect the value addition that the natural dyed fabric brings in is far more than the cost that is you know enhanced. Now, we are just recapitulating the whole uh, scenario of dyes and natural dyes. So, let us try to look at this particular slide where we know that there are two types of dyes natural dyes and synthetic dyes. We have been talking about both because I want to give you an overview and then it is up to you to decide what is good, what is bad because there are goods with synthetic dyes also, there are bad points with natural dyes also. So, one has to outweigh and whatever is available that must be trapped. Now, classification of dyes we have seen that on the basis of chemical constituents they can be indigo dyes, anthroquinone dyes, alpha naphthone dyes, flavone dye, anthocyanin dyes and carotenoid dyes. Now, today's lecture will be mainly emphasizing on the anthocyanidine dyes. On the basis of their colorant or color present that uh, is uh, there, the dyes can be segregated into red types of dyes or blue types of dyes or yellow dyes or black dyes or brown dyes. However, on the basis of their you know how they adhere to the fabric, again another definition can come that they are substantiative dye or adjective dye and among the adjective dye it could be direct dye, wet dye, modern dye, acid dye, basic dye and dispersed dye. So, these are the various nomenclatures, but uh, when we are talking about uh, Natural dyes, they are as we saw that they were mostly modern dyes and therefore, we have to concentrate only on the modern dyes. So, this is how they can be also sourced from plant source, all the anthocyanin dyes are sourced from plant source, but there are other natural dye sources like animal source particularly for cochineal and lac dye and there are mineral sources like some of the salts have transition metal salts have color, they can be used as dyes also. Now, this is the most important slide that we must concentrate now. This particular moiety you see A, B and C, they are three rings which are now nicely beautifully connected and you see that uh, I wanted to draw this picture and make it very clear to you because you see this B rings functionality and A ring functionality is very, very important and that uh, sugar moiety that is hanging at the position of in the C ring is also very conspicuous. Now, because of this kind of arrangement in the molecule, it is possible that the molecule can uh, adjoin the, uh, the metal very easily. Also, they can chelate with the metal and the chelate of the metal can then add on to the fabric, the natural fabrics that is cotton, silk and wool. So, therefore, we can say that anthocyanins have a very good structural detail, very compatible to what is required for an ideal uh, natural dye. Because as when we were talking about uh, um, anthroquinone dyes, I had told you that the alpha hydroxy groups can bring in the metal chelate very easily and that is what makes alizarine a good dye. Similarly, because of these R prime, R three prime, 
R5 prime and R5, R6 and R7. These functionalities can be hydroxy groups or they can be other groups which can be uh, helping in the metal chelation. Now, when we try to understand because we know that the dye and its structure has a great importance in the fact that the more the conjugation in the dye the better or the dark is the color. Dyes contain sequence of conjugated double bonds that is you know you have C double bond C and so on where X is carbon, oxygen or nitrogen. Dyes contain conjugated system of benzene rings bearing simple saturated groups like nitro groups, azo group, carbonyl groups and these are called chromophores. We have already learnt all this, this is just like a recapitulation so that now we can connect 2 and 2 and understand it in a much better manner. And the polar groups like NH2 or OH groups which act uh, not only help in the chelation of the metal atom but also are called oxochrome because they enhance the activity of the chromophore. These chromophore and oxochromes are responsible for the color of the dye. Now, when we come to now once the dye part is understood, dye is actually whether natural or synthetic must have conjugated system. This is one of the most important criteria to be categorized as dye plus it must have a chromophoric group and an oxochrome group. Only then it you know actually becomes an ideal model for being called as a dye. Now once we have understood about the dye, we also know that natural dyes need mordanting because they are modern dyes. So, modern binds the natural dyes to the fabric by chemical reaction between the dye and the fiber. So, as I told you that here is a dye, here is a fiber and the modern act as a bridging head. So, be it any type of fiber, cotton fabric, cotton silk or wool, when it is put in the dye bath, along with uh, you know uh, modern such as alum, copper, uh, copper sulphate, potassium dichromate, stannous chloride. These are the four moderns that we tried out. Dyeing can be carried out. It can be also pre-modenting, meta-modenting or post-modenting. So, we know that there are three modes of modent. Modent can be added in the beginning after the scouring of the fabric. And in the case of cotton, we use tannic acid treatment and then after scouring, there is a tannic acid pretreatment and then mordanting. So, if the mordanting is done beforehand, it is called pre-mordanting. If the mordant and the dye are put in the same dye bath and both are done simultaneously, it is called simultaneous mordanting or meta-mordanting. And the third option is that first after the scouring and uh, after the dyeing, it is then finally mordanted with these mordants. So, the mordants that are used are alum, copper sulphate, potassium dichromate and stannous chloride. Now, uh, time and again I have mentioned that the use of copper and chromium should be minimal and if possible, if one can avoid, it is even better. But many a times what happens is that we need to have shade variation and from the same dye extract it is possible to get different shades by, by altering these moderns. So as what I told you that there are different types of mordant and here we will only discuss the metal mordant and the tannic acid which is used as a pretreatment. Methods of mordanting, we already know that pre-mordanting, meta-mordanting and post-mordanting I have just explained to you. So, it is now, you know, it is more like recapitulating what we had done in the last class with the anthocyanin dyes and also to make you understand that not only hibiscus, even rose which is so abundantly available can be a very rich source of anthocyanin dye. 
and not many people actually have been into the use of this literature review shows that you know there are some 95 references and not many people have worked on the chemistry of rose pigment and looked at it from the point of view of a source of textile dye. However, there have been some you know sporadic uh, information here and there, but nobody has actually worked on anthocyanin dyes. People have worked on the various you know chemistry that means what are the chemical components present in the anthocyanin dyes uh, derived from rose, but they have not seriously looked into a possibility of using this uh, anthocyanin dye as a source of textile dye. So, Lawrence et al have found out that the principal coloring matter are anthocyanin, anthoxanthines and even some carotenoids are present. Similarly, you know the analysis done by Yushimui, a Japanese group, they propose that stabilization of natural anthocyanin can be done by intercalation with Montmerillonate. So, you see they were only working at an aspect as to how to trap this dye and how to because as you would know that because of the positive charge on the oxygen, it is a dye which is very pH sensitive and this we had discussed in great detail in the last lecture that because of its pH sensitivity anthocyanin dyes were not considered so far for textile dyeing. So, now if one has to take a look at how the material can be used for dyeing purpose, the flowers of rose which uh, the botanical name is rosa rosa is actually taken and it is uh, extracted and the instruments that were used for the measurements were UV vis spectrophotometer and color scan machine and the fabric there were three types of fabric they, they, which were used that was cotton, silk and wool. The chemicals that were used were moderns that is the metal moderns, alum, copper sulphate, potassium dichromate and stannous chloride and citric acid and methanol and Cotton was treated with tannic acid only, but silk and wool were only treated with the moderns that is the alum, copper sulphate, potassium dichromate and stannous chloride. So, this is how the whole uh, overview of the procedure what all was used and how they were used. The methodology is that washing and preparation of the fabric is carried out first. Then the extract of the methanolic extract of anthocyanin is done, but while doing the methanolic extract a little bit of citric acid addition can always enhance the extract quality and the more and more dye can come into it. Then the dyeing of the citric this uh, fabric with the anthocyanin extract can be done. But before we do the dyeing of uh, cotton fabric, tannic acid treatment is carried out, then it is dried, then mordenting is carried out. Now, in order to see whether the dye is really anthocyanin or not, UV visible spectrophotometer testing is carried out of the extract. The extraction of anthocyanin dye actually is the most crucial part because the more we can extract the color from the biotic material, the fade, uh, the more uh, concentrated will be the solution and that can be figured out. If the biotic material is getting faded, that means all the colorant has come into the methanolic, acidified methanolic solution. So, that is a you know test to evaluate whether all the dye has come or not. It is not required to heat it for too long time, only a slight heating can uh, actually bring out the color. And once that is done, once the dyeing is carried out, the LAB values are evaluated and before doing that you know dye, before the dyeing uh, or rather before the dye fixing and after the dye fixing the LAB values show 
how much of the dye has actually impregnated into the fabric and therefore there is a need for dye fixing and citric acid is one very good example which was tried out it's a mild acid and it does the retention of the color on the fabric the dye adhesion enhances now if we try to look at the you know the uv visible spectra of the anthocyanin derived from rose you can see that there is a very distinct peak and anthocyanins are known to have a peak between one band in between 475 to 560 as what we saw in the case of hibiscus also which falls in the visible region and the second band which is at 275 to 280 is in the UV region and rightly so we found a very appropriate band at uh, 526 nanometer which shows an absorbance of 0.94 and the yield that was calculated was about 4 percent. So, you see that this dye, this dye source already has just from the flower petals 4 percent of dye can be extracted readily from the rose dye. Now, when the LAB values for cotton fabric dyed by the rose anthocyanin was uh, characterized before fixing with citric acid the values showed that the K by S values were between 62 or rather 50 to 132 and the highest being for stannous chloride. This is the same observation that we had in case of hibiscus anthocyanin also. So, you see that stannous chloride seems to be the ideal mordant for this rose anthocyanin and it is also. So, we can conclude that for anthocyanin dye stannous chloride mordant seems to be having good functionality and it, it does not fall into the you know dangerous category like copper and chromium. So, it can be safely used, but every time we are using mordant it should be kept in mind that the minimum amount of mordant should be used otherwise there could be problems arising uh, in the effluent treatment or uh, effluent management. Now, when the same cotton dyed fabric is uh, treated with citric acid the dye fix shows that lot of dye has run off. You see that means that dye fixing now what is the situation of the K by S value we should not get you know perturbed by the fact that oh so much of dye has run off even then it has very rich color and we will see the fabric very soon and we will then understand. And here also the K by S value shows that for stannous chloride the value is 130. So, if we go back from 132 it has only reduced to 130. So, treatment with citric acid has not reduced the color strength in the case of stannous chloride. Whereas, in the case of other mordants and in the case of control fabric it has shown considerable change. So, this also goes to indicate that for rose anthocyanin uh, the ideal mordant is stannous chloride. Now, you see that as compared to the hibiscus fabric which you had seen last time the controlled fabric look at the control fabric which has been just treated with the pre treatment tannic acid and the alum piece and the copper sulphate piece, the potassium dichromate piece and the stannous chloride piece. So, you see stannous chloride shows very deep color. Similarly, if we take a look at the silk fabric before the treatment of the citric acid, before fixing with citric acid, you will find that the K by S values vary from 48 to 137 and here also the compatibility is best for stannous chloride. Similarly, if we go to the fabric treated after fixing with citric acid the values have decreased from 
137 it has decreased to 111 but still it is showing good values for k by s values and therefore stannous chloride is also rightly suited for the compatibility of rose anthocyanin and the fabrics look a uh, little faded in this case but definitely stannous chloride is much much darker for silk as well now when we try to look at the wool samples and we try to see the, what is the situation of the anthocyanin dyed fabric before citric acid treatment they range the k by s value ranges from 63 to 222 which shows very good dye uptake you see k by s value shows dye uptake but some of it is only adhering to the surface so the moment the citric acid fixing is done you will see that uh, the color runs off here also the compatibility goes to show that stannous chloride is showing the best result in the case uh, in the terms of k by s value which is the color strength now when it is fixed with citric acid it was found that it has deduced from 222 to 119 which is almost like going half the way so one can see but even then the uh, stannous chloride value stands out but here in this case in the case of wool even potassium dichromate shows reasonably good values for k by s so both now we can say for wool potassium dichromate and uh, stannous chloride both can be used readily so you see it is obvious from these um, you know even dyed samples if you see this dyed samples one can evaluate these things what i have told you just now now so if we have to take an overview of the k by s value only it in each case then let us go in the increasing order in the case of cotton the order of k by s value after fixing was found because see before fixing we cannot say that this is the best method because after all the fabric needs to be treated completely the finishing process must be complete so finishing of the fabric ends only in the step of dye fixing so therefore these values are of more important but that was more to see how much the dye is taken up and how much is run off in the water so if we try to look at the cotton values control is uh, poorest then alum then copper sulfate and then potassium dichromate and then stannous chloride and in this same is the sequence in the case of silk control copper sulfate alum so you see potassium dichromate and stannous are the two modernes which are quite good for cotton and silk and similarly we will see that in the case of wool also after fixing alum was the worst it was even worse than the so it, it cannot be recommended at all for wool dyeing but copper sulfate potassium dichromate and stannous so finally what do we come to a conclusion if we by looking at the kys value that potassium dichromate or even better is stannous chloride that should be used as a modern for this uh, dyeing of cotton wool and silk by rose anthocyanin so if we now have to conclude anthocyanin pigments was extracted from the petals of rosa rosa which is rose and by using it pure natural fabric for dyeing better results were obtained with few particular modernes but the best result was obtained with stannous chloride modernes with good washing fastness due to their non-toxic properties low pollution and less side effects there is an increasing awareness among people towards natural dyes most of the flowers contain anthocyanin dyes and it can very well be used as a dye material giving primarily different shades of reds and pinks 
The wash fastness of metal complex dye is due to the ability of the dye molecules to associate with large aggregates in the fiber and because of the intermolecular hydrogen bonding. So, you see the way one can have an overview of why now it is time to accept anthocyanin dyes as textile dyes because they fit into the category of the features that a textile dye must have. That is it sh the dye should be soluble in water, the dye should have good functional or oxochrome groups so that the metal mordant can attach and the subsequently the metal mordanted uh, dye will be able to attach on the fabric. And if a dye follows all these parameters or if it has these characteristics, if it is abundantly and cheaply available, if it is uh, having the right kind of functionality. Now, you see that there are many, many chemicals or compounds of this and many possibilities are there where the R 3 prime, R 5 prime, R 5, R 6, R 7 in the A ring and the cleavage of this particular. Okay, so, the A group, the A ring, the C ring and the B ring and the different functionalities and the cleavage of this giving rise to anthocyanidine they are responsible for good functionality and good linking of the metal ring and metal and the rings and the structure and therefore these dyes are very appropriate for textile because they have the right kind of functional group if we have to now look at the overview that anthocyanins why they were not tapped. Why is it that this dye had so much uh, I mean it was so abundantly available from time immemorable, but why is it that it did not enter into the textile market because of the simple reason that extraction process and the dyeing process were not standardized. We try to standardize the extraction process and we also try to look at that means we try to standardize the extraction and the extraction of anthocyanin dyes with the help of methanol plus citric acid. was evaluated by us for the first time because we thought that if more and more dye has to be extracted, it is necessary to find a method for extraction because what was happening by using just water, the dye was not coming completely into the aqueous solution and by using methanol methanol cannot be used for an industrial pro process. So, we try to take a 50-50 solution of water and methanol and added a pinch of citric acid just to alter the pH. Now, this alteration of the pH actually helped in extraction of the complete anthocyanin that was present in rows. So, that is where there was an edge, that is where the uh, technology that we developed had an edge over the existing aqueous extraction process and that really helped because we were able now after the extract was uh, obtained, either we use it immediately after uh, you know 50 percent concentration or we put it on the rotary evaporator. See there was a step I will go back to the slide so that you can recall that during the process of uh, 
extraction or methods and material that we were discussing, this extraction of rose, there was a use of rotary evaporator. Now, this rotary evaporator actually can remove the methanol completely and water as well at reduced uh, uh, you know pressure. So, it does not hamper the chemical moiety of the anthocyanin dye and because the dye is in intact and there is the pH is slightly acidic it can be left in the uh, room or on the shelf for months and it can be just used at the time of use. So, the problem that we were facing about natural dye that it the extract should be immediately used otherwise it goes bad or if the uh, you know uh, the difficulties that natural dyes normally had those we were trying to overcome. And in the case of rose dye, particularly because it was so abundantly available, we have done a lot of standardization not only in the terms of dye, dyeing, but also the major breakthrough was in the process of extraction and extraction and preservation of that dye. Can we keep that dye? Does it get deteriorated? No, it does not get deteriorated even with uh, daylight and does not get fungal growth because there is a slight excess of citric acid which keeps the pH at a level where fungus do not grow. So, that way we were able to preserve these dye paste and use it at a later date. So, that is what made this dye such a, a good dye and it is such a rich source. So, let us now conclude this lecture that anthocyanins can be a good textile dye because of their cost effectivity, high availability and good compatibility with the fabric, all the three natural fabrics cotton, silk and wool.